Hello, my name is Amit Power and thank you for joining me for this short presentation looking at the anatomy and ultrasound of the brachial plexus. I do have a YouTube channel and if you'd like to subscribe to it, uh, this QR code will take you to that page. I do have a few disclosures but none of these will impact on my ability to deliver this talk uh, but please do note that I use a complete anatomy app from 3D4 Medical for many of my slide animations. Let's start off by taking a trip back to medical school because effectively this is what we're going to be looking at. We're relating to the brachial plexus, its roots, trunks, divisions, cords and branches and we'll go through this in a little bit more detail later. So what do I aim to highlight over the next 25 minutes? We're going to talk about the brachial plexus but specifically look at the interscaling brachial plexus, the superior trunk, the supraclavicular brachial plexus, the infraclavicular with a shout out to the retroclavicular block and the auxiliary brachial plexus and then to tie it all together I'm also going to mention the suprascapular nerve block, the auxiliary nerve block and the distal nerves of the elbow and mid forearm. So there's quite a lot of information to cover so let's get started. You may well remember a diagram like this from medical school which shows the brachial plexus is made up of the roots, the anterior primary rami of C5 to T1. You can see here on this diagram, C5 and C6 roots come together to form the superior trunk, C7 continues as the middle trunk, and C8 and T1 come together to form the lower trunk. Each of those trunks has an anterior and a posterior division. I've highlighted the posterior divisions here in red, and you can see all of the posterior divisions come together to form the posterior cord, which then terminates in the axillary and radial nerves. The anterior divisions of the superior and the middle trunk come together to form the lateral cord, which then ends in the muscular cutaneous nerve, but also gives a sling towards the median nerve. And the anterior division of the lower trunk continues as the medial cord, which terminates in the ulnar nerve, but also gives a sling to the median nerve. And you have that classical M type appearance, which is often spotted in cadavers. We can add on to this some extra nerves. We here, here you can see the dorsal scapular nerve and the long thoracic, the suprascapular nerve coming off the superior trunk, the medial or the lateral and the medial pectoral nerves coming off the respective uh, cords of the brachial plexus, in addition to the medial brachial cutaneous nerve um, uh, and the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve. So this is relevant. But now let's superimpose onto here where we would perform these relevant blocks. As you can see here, the interscalings happening at root level. The superior trunk happens at the superior trunk. You've got the supraclavicular happening at the divisions, uh, infraclavicular of the cords, and the auxiliary brachial plexus takes place at the branches. So now let's start by looking at the interscaling brachial plexus. And certainly the way that we've learned anatomy now uh, has changed. So let's have a look now in a little bit more detail. So we're going to take away uh, the skin, and if we have a look through a bit deeper here, you can see we've got the sternocleidomastoid, we remove the sternocleidomastoid, and then we've got the anterior scalene, and behind that, the middle scalene. Let's zoom in a bit closer, and in fact, let's remove the, uh, the middle scalene. And as we have a look in here, we can now see the C5 nerve root, the C6 nerve root, C7, C8, and T1. And we're going to appreciate the relation of all of those together. And these videos, as I say, have come from the 3D4 Medical's Essential Anatomy app. So this is the type of image one might generate if you were to place the probe transversely on the neck. And of course, unless you particularly know what you're looking like, this can look a little bit like a snowstorm. Uh, we know that we've got some circular hypoechoic structures and we think there may be nerves but let me give you the cheat sheet i'll give you the answers so here we go you can see you've got the sternocleidomastoid this is medial um projecting over the anterior scalene and the middle scalene with the c5 c6 and c7 nerve roots sandwiched between those scalene muscles in the interscalene groove but i've highlighted some extra structures that you may not be aware of the dorsal scapular nerve and the long thoracic nerve which in a static image can be difficult to interpret but if you look at a moving image you'll often see them so if i remove that overlay for a second you can get a suggestion that 
the there's you know, circular hypochoic structures here. This second one here has got a suggestion of having a bifid appearance, which is classical of C6. And then this is C7 down here. But again, if you were to look at a static image of the uh, middle scaly muscle, you wouldn't necessarily highlight these structures as being uh, the long thoracic and the dorsal scapular nerve. So we'll reapply that um, color overlay. And also just to mention that the structures don't always appear like they do in the textbook and there are some anatomical variations. So there are some, some simple things we can do to try and identify the level correctly. So let's start off by looking at the cervical vertebra and we'll look at some characteristic appearances of the cervical transverse processes. So that's C5, here we've got C6 and now we've got C7. So if we turn the cervical vertebrae on this side and focus on the transverse processes, and again, you'll have to use a bit of artistic license here, but what you'll appreciate is that most of these cases, if you were to look at the cervical transverse processes, they've got this U-shaped appearance, except for C7. There is no anterior tubercle of C7. You'll see C5 has got an anterior tubercle and a posterior tubercle. C6 has got an anterior post a tubercle and a posterior tubercle, and often, the anterior tubercle of C6 is actually very, very prominent, but C7 has got a completely flat part over here, so you don't see an anterior tubercle. So this is relevant when you come to looking at the neck. The other thing to mention, of course, is that when you have a look at what happens with the vertebral artery, the vertebral artery passes through this foramen at the C5 and at the C6 level, and so it's kind of protected from, from access but when you look at the C7 level, you can appreciate here that the vertebral artery is actually exposed. Um, now we're going to have a look at um, a scan of my neck, and I've kind of mocked up a virtual uh, scanning app. So on the right-hand side of the screen, this virtual probe is going to move in time coordinated with the ultrasound image on the left. So I'm starting relatively high up in the neck at what would be the C5 level. And you'll just see before we start the video, there's a very prominent anterior tubercle of C5. Uh, and we're about to see, as I start the video, the C5 nerve root emerge. So let's start this video now. And you'll see we're about to see C5 emerge from here. That's C5 coming out. C6 now comes out of the transverse process, a very prominent chassis next tubercle or anterior tubercle of C6. And there's C7 coming out right at the bottom. And you will have the vertebral artery exposed over here. So on this image here now, you can see we've got a very obvious C5, C6 in close proximity to it with that bifid appearance, and C7 down here. And the vertebral artery will be exposed as well. So how does the interscaling view differ from the superior trunk. Now, what's relevant with the superior trunk is we want to make sure, and when we're using a superior trunk, we're often using it for shoulder innovation, but we want to make sure we catch the superior trunk before the suprascapular nerve leaves it. So let's have a look at the neck and see what that might look like. So again, we're going to start now with the skin. Let's, re let's uh, remove the skin and have a look in a little bit more detail. As we look inside here in a bit more detail, we're going to highlight some structures. So here is the superior trunk. Uh, and there's the omohyoid muscle, and that's relevant as a landmark for identifying the suprascapular nerve, which I've highlighted here. Uh, so there's the superior trunk, and you can see the suprascapular nerve is just leaving it at this point, just like that diagram. And you can see how that superior trunk is formed from C5 and C6 coming together. If we were to have a look at an ultrasound, let's see what happens here. So now we're going to highlight these structures. You can see here the omohyoid is a muscle lying over the superior trunk. I'll go back and show you that here. You've now got the superior trunk, which is C5 and C6 coming together. And in this particular slice, we've got the omohyoid muscle lying on top of it. And you can see that again highlighted. Now, again, we'll move on to this virtual scanning uh, app over here. We're going to see what happens as we move from the, the C5 and C6 coming together to form the superior trunk, and we're going to start to scan inferiorly or towards the clavicle. Let's see that happening. So you're going to see now, as see the superior trunk comes together, you can see a black circle leaving it, just leaving underneath the cover of the omohyoid muscle. And actually, this structure at the top over here is a superior trunk, and that black circle just to the right of it is the suprascapular nerve leaving it. So if you want to form a, perform a superior trunk block, one needs to perform it before the suprascapular nerve leaves that superior trunk.
Now let's move on to the supraclavicular brachial plexus. Uh, and again, let's have a look at that anatomy in a bit more detail. Remove the skin, we'll go in a little bit closer over here, and you can see behind the clavicle is where all of the action is. Let's remove that trapezius muscle. There's the clavicle, uh, and you can actually see there's the sternocleidomastoid, you've got the middle scalene, uh, the anterior scalene, and now if we go in a bit more detail, you can here see here you've got the subclavian artery lying on the first rib, and immediately posterior, and there's the first rib there, immediately posterior and lateral to that is the brachial plexus, but I've also highlighted the suprascapular artery and the transverse cervical artery, which are two arterial structures that may become relevant, and you almost certainly will see them when you're scanning the neck. So please be aware of the suprascapular artery and the transverse cervical artery. This is the type of image one might generate when you're performing a supraclavicular block. The bright white line that you're looking at there is the first rib and not the clavicle because you're scanning posterior to the clavicle. But you've got this classic appearance, and so let's add in some color overlay here. You can see you've got the pleura lying beneath the first rib, the omohyoid muscle, the subclavian artery, and the plexus lying posterior to it. And you often will see the middle scaling muscle here inserting onto the first rib. So again, now let's see what this looks like if you scan it in real time. We've got the probe now here positioned on the first rib, and you can see that classical appearance of that slightly higher elevation of the posterior aspect of the first rib. So now as we start to scan, I'm scanning anteriorly, the anterior pleura, and posteriorly the posterior pleura. This forms what I consider to be the podium sign, where first place, second place, and third place of a metal podium, going back up the neck and then coming back down again, you can see here by probe movement, you can alter the position that the subclavian artery uh, takes. And ultimately, when we block it, we want the plexus and the artery, if possible, to be lying on that first rib. So this is when I say, when I refer to the podium view, the metal podium view, I'm talking about the first rib being first place, the pleura anteriorly being second place, and the pleura on the right-hand side of the screen being third place. That makes me think of a metal podium, so I always like to keep that in mind. Uh, the next uh, approach to brachial plexus I wanted to talk about is the infraclavicular brachial plexus. So again, let's have a look in a bit more detail. Let's remove the skin. If we remove the skin and zoom in here, we can see a very large muscle. That's the pec major muscle. If we remove that out of the way, you then got pec minor. So pec major and pec minor will remove both of those muscles. And we'll zoom in uh, and look in a bit closer here. So there you can see the axillary artery below the clavicle. Uh, you can see the coracoid process on the right-hand side. Uh, there is the lateral cord. That's the, the structure you most easily encounter when you're uh, looking for uh, the cords of the brachial plexus. Between the artery and the vein, you see the medial cord. And actually, if we have a look right at the back, there is the posterior cord. So you can appreciate, as you're looking at all of these nerves around the artery, there are some other vascular structures in the way. And the one that I really want to emphasize is this very large and very prominent cephalic vein, which you will definitely see leave the axillary vein as you're scanning to look for the infraclavicular brachial plexus. So let's have a look at what the sononati may be looking like. So here uh, is an image here, and you can see we've got so a small amount of adipose tissue, then we've got two muscles, some vessels, and possibly some neural structures. So let's highlight those for us. We've got pec major and pec minor. You can see the axillary artery and the axillary vein. Now, in this particular shot, I've highlighted what I think is a, a, an obvious lateral cord uh, and something underneath the axillary artery, which is a posterior cord, and I've highlighted a suggestion of where the medial cord may be. But very often, when you're scanning for the infraclavicular brachial plexus, uh, actually, the cords haven't rotated fully around the artery, and often... When you're looking at the six o'clock position of the axillary artery, what you're actually looking at is the medial cord that has yet to migrate and rotate around the artery. So if I take the highlighting off, it's possible that when you look at the axillary artery here, the lateral cord is often the most obvious structure to see, but it's possible that actually lying in a separate fascial sheath underneath the lateral cord below the artery, the, uh, the posterior cord and the medial cord are both lying together. And often this only becomes evident when you rotate the probe and you slide medial to lateral. That's my suggestion of the overlay, but in fact, when you have a look in real time, you may see the cords in a slightly different position. So let's have a look and see. And I always like to start scanning 
very medially on the clavicle so I can visualize the axillary vein and the axillary artery emerging from undercover of the clavicle. So let's see that process happening here. Of course, when you do this, I always abduct the arm, but on this particular um, anatomy app, I could not get the arm abducted. But when I'm scanning, I'm usually scanning with the arm in abduction. So we'll scan here. The vein leaves and the cephalic vein comes off very early. You then got the axillary artery, you can see the axillary vein. And again, in this particular view here, I would suggest uh, on inspection that actually the lateral cord is very clearly visible, um, super, uh, the, you know, the superior aspect of the axillary artery, possibly at the 1130 position. And there are two bright white hyperechoic structures lying underneath the axillary artery. And it's possible at this stage that we've got the posterior cord lying just below the lateral cord and actually the medial cord is lying right underneath the artery and it's only when you scan even further round you'll see them rotate. So what are some of the issues with the classical infraclavicular block? Well a lot of them relate to the fact that you've got a steep insertion angle and sometimes it can be difficult to, visible, to visualize the needle as a result and often there are many vessels in the path of the needle and sometimes there's a narrow uh, space to navigate between the clavicle uh, and where you're placing the ultrasound probe and I'll show you an example here one of my previous fellows had a very very vascular approach to the infraclavicular brachial plexus you can see a whole host of blood vessels in the way that may make a needle path down to the, the sweet spot slightly challenging and that is where the retroclavicular approach to the infraclavicular region, affectionately termed the wrap tear block, may well have a role. So let's have a look at what's involved. So again, now let's have a look at some of the structures on the classical approach to the infraclavicular region, and then we'll have a look through the eyes of the wrap tear block. So we're going to remove the skin, and we can see here um, where we need to get to. And I'm going to highlight the posterior cord, that slightly lighter yellow structure. That's the structure we want to get to. So now if we rotate the body round, and we'll have a look through the eyes uh, or the approach uh, for, for, for Raptor, you can see you're inserting your needle at the posterior aspect behind the clavicle. And as you do that, you can see you've got a really nice straight direction down to the posterior cord bearing in mind that there, there will be a blind spot from where you insert the needle and where you place the ultrasound probe, and that there are some structures in the way, namely the suprascapular artery and the suprascapular nerve, and if you get your needle insertion wrong, you've got the pleura with lung below it that one needs to be aware of. So it is a technique that one can use, but it's something to be aware of. It does have its own pitfalls. Now we'll move on to the auxiliary brachial plexus. So now let's have a look at what anatomy is involved here. Again, the arm would normally be abducted, but I've removed the body to kind of highlight it. You can see here uh, we've got the biceps brachii muscle, uh, and now here we've got the, the other head of biceps brachii. We're now going to go in a little bit closer, and we can highlight the coracobrachialis muscle. Uh, and in relation to that, you'll see um, some nerve structure. There's a muscular cutaneous nerve. Next thing we're going to highlight is the uh, axillary artery. And in relation to that, you've got the median nerve lying above it. You've got the ulnar nerve. And posterior to the ulnar nerve, you have got the radial nerve. So those are the structures that we're going to hopefully aim to identify when we're scanning to perform an axillary brachial plexus block. And I'm just scanning here just to appreciate, so you can appreciate that these, of course, are running along the length of the arm. And one of the beauties about the auxiliary brachial plexus block is you can scan superior and laterally or, or medially and laterally and trace those nerves along their path. This is a sort of a snapshot of the, of the ideal view that you might get when you're scanning for the auxiliary brachial plexus. And I've highlighted, here we go, biceps brachii, both heads of biceps, we've got the coracobrachialis muscle, and classically, in a large proportion of the population, the muscular cutaneous nerve is sandwiched between those two muscles. You then really want to get a view here of what we anesthetists call the conjoint tendon, which is the confluence of teres major and latissimus dorsi coming together. And above that conjoint tendon, you'll often see the radial nerve lying somewhere along that line, Got a median nerve in a classical position lying around 11 o'clock or 11.30 on the axillary artery. And the ulnar nerve, which generally tends to lie between the axillary artery and the axillary vein. But of course, there's lots of variations. So that's the sort of classic image. I'll remove the overlay again. 
unless you scan up and down you can see that sometimes it's difficult to identify those with a single snapshot and there's the overlay again so let's now have a look at scanning this in real time and I've got my virtual probe so we're going to have a look at the muscular cutaneous nerve twice to start off with and then we'll trace the median the ulna and the radial so let's start off now we're going to see if we can identify this muscle snaking its way between biceps brachii and coracobrachialis that's the muscular cutaneous nerve it has that classical sort of snake eyes appearance so we'll see that process happening there let's go back up uh, and we'll see the auxiliary artery. We're now going to look above this auxiliary artery at 12 o'clock here is the median nerve. And as we scan down the arm, we'll see the median nerve will start to rotate over the artery. We'll go back up again. Now we'll release the pressure, see the auxiliary vein, and now we're going to try and identify the ulnar nerve. And as the ulnar nerve moves, as you move down the arm, it should move off to the right-hand side of the screen. So it's just about to fall off the screen there. There's the ulnar nerve. We're going to go back up now. And now we want to see if we can identify the radial nerve on that conjoint tendon. As we pull away, we're going to see the radial nerve dive down towards the humerus. So here we go, it's coming down, it's wrapping around the humerus, and I'm going back up again. There's the radial nerve sitting right underneath the axillary artery. So we've covered most of those components now, uh, and now I'm going to very briefly look at the suprascapular nerve block, the axillary nerve block, and the distal nerves of the arm um, from the elbow to mid forearm. So we've got a few more things to look at. Now, why um, might it be useful to avoid doing an interscaling nerve block? Well, it may be useful because potentially one might be able to reduce the incidence of phrenic nerve palsy. Uh, one might be able to reduce the chance of injury to the uh, to the nerve roots and also to the dorsal scapular nerve and long thoracic nerve hidden within the middle scaly muscle. One may be able to reduce the risk of pneumothorax and possibly avoid uh, um, or reduce the chance of local anesthetic systemic toxicity and arterial injections. So if you don't perform uh, an inscaling nerve block, what options do you have? There are a couple of options. You've got the suprascapular nerve block, uh, and you can also do a suprascapular nerve block plus an auxiliary nerve block, or some people would say doing a posterior cord injection for the infraclavicular brachial plexus. So let's have a look at this suprascapular nerve. Again, let's remove the skin here and have a look in a bit more detail. And as we zoom in again here, we will see there's a suprascapular nerve leaving the superior trunk uh, under the cover uh, at the moment of the uh, trapezius muscle. Let's remove that and we'll appreciate that in a bit more detail. So let's get, a, get rid of trapezius. And as we zoom in here, what you're going to notice is the suprascapular nerve having passed by omohyoid comes back towards the supraspinous fossa. Let's get rid of supraspinatus. And there you can see the suprascapular nerve is passing underneath this transverse scapular ligament. And it's lying on the floor of the supraspinous fossa in close proximity to the suprascapular artery. So that's one other approach. And there's a super, um, the, the ligament there. And you can see here, there are a couple of approaches to the suprascapular nerve. You can get it either in the supraspinous fossa or at the base of the neck. So let's have a look at looking at the suprascapular nerve in the supraspinous fossa. So now we're going to start scanning um, at the patient's back, relatively laterally, looking down onto the floor of the supraspinous fossa. We're going to have um, trapezius above and the supraspinatus muscle below. So let's start scanning. The scan from medial to lateral. Here's the floor of the supraspinous fossa, and it has this classical kind of hockey stick shape base to it. When you get to that point, you will often see the trapezius, the supraspinatus, uh, and the uh, suprascapular artery lying right next to the suprascapular nerve. What about the auxiliary nerve? If we wanted to spot the auxiliary nerve, how can we see that? Well, let's uh, remove the skin and go in in a bit more detail here. We have a look over here you will see there's the auxiliary nerve and uh, we've got deltoid right at the top uh, a fade deltoid you can see how it appears just as the humerus is starting to come up to the head of the humerus we remove the deltoid we've got part of triceps there the lateral head uh, and then another part of triceps is on the right hand side of the screen so let's remove the lateral head and zoom in in a bit more detail and you can see how um, the auxiliary nerve is lying right near the posterior circumflex humeral artery. So we should be able to demonstrate this on ultrasound. So here we go, we're starting at the posterior aspect of the humerus 
aiming to get a bright white line, which is the humerus, the shaft of the humerus, and we're going to start scanning up towards the head of the humerus. As we start to scan up, we're noticing the muscle fibers are starting to change. We're starting to see the fibers of deltoid coming into view. And at this point here, you can see the posterior circumflex humeral artery with the auxiliary nerve lying under cover of deltoid. We're now on the last part of the lecture. We're going to look at nerves of the forearm. And let's start off by looking at the median nerve. So we're going to start off in the, uh, the antecubital fossa. As you can see here, we've got, um, if I remove the skin, we'll zoom in a bit closer. You can see we've got the median uh, nerve lying medial to the brachial artery. As we start to scan down the arm, it will lie under the cover of pronator teres, and it will start to emerge further distal in the forearm, but sandwiched between flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus. So you can see the median nerve sandwiched between those two muscle layers in a very classical appearance. There we go, so there's flexor digitorum superficialis, median nerve between it, and flexor digitorum profundus. What about the ulnar nerve? Well, to start the ulnar nerve, I often try to scan or start scanning right down at the wrist. And I know at the wrist you'll identify the ulnar artery, and the ulnar nerve tends to lie on the ulnar side of the ulnar artery. So let's have a look and zoom in in a bit more detail here. So we'll zoom in on the wrist, you can see the ulnar nerve coming right out over there. Uh, and Let's have a look at some of the other structures here. If we zoom in now, see there's the ulnar artery. Ulnar nerve lies on the ulnar side of the ulnar artery, and there's flexor carpi ulnaris right on the ulnar side. So now let's start watching and looking at what happens in real time, and then you've got flexor digitorum superficialis medially. As you scan up the arm, you'll see there's a point when the ulnar artery leaves the ulnar nerve. That's often a good point at which you can block that structure here. But you can see you've got the ulna, flexor carpi ulnaris, um, and then flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus, and the ulnar nerve sandwiched in that sort of in between those muscles. And at this point, you've just seen the ulnar artery leave. How about radial nerve to finish off with? So let's have a look right now. And I tend to start off scanning the radial nerve at the uh, antecubital fossa um, because this is a nice point where you can see some of these classical muscles and the, st the typical appearance. So we'll go in a bit more detail. Uh, the first muscle you can see here, well actually let's get the cephalic vein highlighted. Then you've got brachioradialis. And if we remove brachioradialis, you'll see deep to that uh, and medial you've got brachialis. And the radial nerve lies right near those two muscles sandwiched between them effectively. Uh, and on the surface, on top of those muscles, you can then see the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. So here, Highlighted in this area, you can see I'm bouncing the cephalic vein, brachioradialis laterally, brachialis medially, and the radial nerve sandwiched between them. So lots of generic views here of the, the classical appearance of the nerves. And now the best thing for you to do is to pick out an ultrasound uh, and start scanning yourself and see if all of this makes sense. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you found this useful.